Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all here. Very pleased to welcome Mark Hart to us, a great supporter of Southwest Wings. It's always wonderful to see you, Mark. Mark's publishing public information officer with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, and you may well be familiar to many of you having seen him on TV and heard him on the radio, perhaps, uh, as he does a lot of the news media work for him. Um, he joined the department in 2009 and also serves as public information officer for the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. So all of us who go out and enjoy the countryside here, we have to take care. And one of the things we have to take care about is some of the wildlife we're hoping to see. Because some of it is potentially dangerous and none more than the black bear. In 2012, the Game and Fish Department fielded approximately 100 black bear related phone calls in the summer. This was following the Monument Fire. And there's no doubt that what happens to the habitat affects behavior of all the wildlife and it can bring some wildlife closer into contact with us than perhaps we'd like. So, a bird or two out in the back country needs to be bear aware. And anyone who goes up into the canyons, some of these less in more inaccessible canyons, certainly need to be. So, Mark now I think is going to tell us a little bit more about what happens uh, potentially with encounter sites, what you should do, and what he is doing to help make sure that that isn't a problem. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the introduction was correct about the danger posed by black bears, but my intent here today is not to scare you. I want to help you understand black bears and black bears' behavior, and also how we manage them, because when we talk about wildlife management, you might wonder, what is that? So I've got a case study here. But the fact of the matter is, statistically, in Arizona, you're twice as likely to be hurt by a black bear than a mountain lion. Mountain lions have this fearsome reputa reputation, but it's really that bears are more dangerous. So we're going to talk about 2012 a lot. I know that seems like a long time ago. I guess I'm showing my age. Um, but that was a very big deal in terms of bear management in the state of Arizona. Not only here in Sierra Vista, statewide. I brought some bear artifacts today. Uh, when we're done with the presentation, please feel free to come up. Be careful with the skull. I got all the way down here and I realized I didn't have a bear skull in my kit. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service loaned me this one. The rest is ours. And there's a bear ear tag here. We'll talk about why we use this bear ear tag from time to time. And some um, rubber assembly claws. I'm sorry, or claws. They're not <laughs> in the best of shape. They come from a bear box that we loan out to schools. Oh, the kids just love to pull the claws off. <laughs> so, um, there's a really good sample out uh, by the San Pedro White Perry Conservation Areas display that shows not only the tracks better than I've got here, but the staff. Um, you'll know a bear track when you see one. They've got five toes, so they look a little humanoid in both the front and back, but the claws are unmistakable. When you see, especially if it's, uh, say, mud or some soft uh, soil, when you see those claws, it'll increase your heart rate a little bit. Your eyes will get bigger. If you're out and about, and you see this sign, no, this isn't just something we post low yellow. That means a bear act, something has been going on with the bear in that location. So you need to kind of have your head on a swivel and be aware. Be bear aware. And bear wise. Love this cartoon. Um, when we talk about bears and problem bears, what we really ought to be talking about is problem humans, because more times than not, when we have issues with bears in southeastern Arizona and elsewhere in the state, there's a human nexus, right? There's a bear human nexus. And so us trying to educate the public is a constant uh, mission of ours. That's all I do as a public information officer, is try and educate the public on wildlife and how to live with it. So, this is about bear, black bears in the Sky Islands, which are our non-contiguous mountain ranges down here in southeastern Arizona. And as become evident during the course of the presentation, it's not just our job. I mean, we're the lead. You own the wildlife. 
we manage it for you, uh, but without uh, other agencies, without participation by the public, it's quite a challenging task. Um, this photo is from the Reef Townsite Campground at the top of Car Canyon Road, shot in 2010 by one of our wildlife officers. It really, it's quite a dramatic photo, particularly when you consider mom's posture. <laughs> She's like, okay, you can check us out, but don't get any closer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just briefly, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff fast. I got a lot of slides, and I'm not going to subject you to death by PowerPoint. We've got polar bears, we got brown bears, also known as grizzly bears, and we got black bears. You may see a brown black bear, but it's not a grizzly bear, it's a black bear. That's all we have in Arizona. And here are the range of these respective species. You notice wide distribution on the black bear throughout the continent. Um, polar bears mostly up in the Arctic Circle. We used to have grizzly bears in Arizona. The last grizzly bear was here, I believe, in 1934. But their range has gradually shrunk. And we would be having a different presentation if we were managing grizzly bears. God bless my colleagues in Wyoming. They have hands. <laughs> But black bears aren't all black, okay? They come in different shapes. We have blonde black bears, we have brown black bears, we have jet black black bears. Uh, a couple of things about bears, if you should be lucky enough to see one from afar. Um, we, the way we tell them apart, there's a couple ways we can do it without actually getting hands on it. You notice how big the cub's ears are? The ears won't, won't grow any larger as they mature, but their heads will get bigger. So if you see a bear that's got tiny little, little ears, it's probably an older bear. If he's got those big puppy <laughs> dog uh, ears, uh, it's probably a young one. They're, distri they're distributed throughout the north just part of the state to the southeast part of the state. True bear country in Arizona is roughly from Pine Top up to Flagstaff, because of the dense forest up there. But we have these pockets, the Sky Highland Mountain Range, so when you get above elevation, 5,000, you're in bear country. That doesn't mean they don't come down into the desert environment from time to time. I'll show you some examples of that. But mainly they're at elevation 5,000 above. When you start seeing oaks, junipers, manzanita, you know you're in bear country. What do they eat? Everything. Anything they can get their hands on, they'll eat. From, from dead stuff, which is why if you have a bear that's approaching you, it won't break off its approach, you should not play dead because they'll eat dead stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they're the worst Insects, but they, they're really uh, particularly fond of juniper berries, acorns, and manzanita nuts, particularly in the fall when they're trying to fatten up. In the springtime, but down here, they start emerging usually by late March. We've got bears coming out of their dens. They don't have a true hibernation. It's a, a cobra, and it's a semi-hibernative state, but they're really hungry when they get out. And believe it or not, to get their digestive systems going after they've been uh, couch potatoes all winter, they sometimes eat grass to get their digestive system working. Then in the fall, the name of the game is let's bulk up because right, we're going to be relatively inactive from about December. By late December, they're all in their dens, and they start coming out again in March. This year, they were late. They didn't come out until the end of April. We don't know why. Why do bears come around humans? Well, resources. It's as simple as that. It's about really about resources and finding stuff to eat, because they eat almost anything. And they have a keen sense of smell. They can smell stuff a mile off. So if they smell food, they're coming your way. Pet food outdoors, bird feeders, even those hummingbird feeders with nectar are attractive for bears. They love dumpsters and garbage cans, which is why many campgrounds have the locking mechanisms on the garbage cans, or these bear boxes, which are basically foot lockers about waist high, that lock. Uh, fruit falling from trees is an attractant. 
and barbecue grills. They can smell that unclean barbecue grill, so they'll come check, come and check it out at a minimum. What people do, this is my stupid people trick slide. Don't do this stuff, please. It happens every year. Don't feed wildlife, okay? And in, in Cochise County, in unincorporated Cochise County, it's illegal to feed wildlife. And the hind is pretty hefty, $1,500, I believe, less than that. Um, also, it's illegal in Maricopa, Pinal, and Pima counties. It's just a bad idea. Once they get used to eating human source food, they can become quite insatiable in seeking it out. And that's a problem for outdoor recreationists. It's a problem for homeowners at that elevation of 5,000 above. That's a problem for us because we have to manage them. Look at this <laughs> This is an extraordinary secret. So it's bird feeders, even with seed. That's what this guy's going for. There he goes. These aren't my photos. I have no idea what happened with this bear. Somebody thought they were doing a good job. Somebody thought they were doing a good job. It's probably, you know, ideally it's 10 feet off the ground, four feet from either post. And this bear just was Dig determined. <laughs> 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 I don't like the slogan of that bear is a dead bear, but you hear it a lot. The problem becomes one of escalating behavior once they get used to human source food. Like maybe they do something um, uh, innocent, like not go for a garbage can. Okay, and now they figured out that's a food source, and that garbage can is close to home. So now it smells stuff cooking in the house, now it wants to get into the house. That's a problem. And we have, over the years, we've had to take a very hard line with nails because they get so big, they can be 350, 400 pounds, and they are naturally more aggressive than females uh, and cubs that they must be put down if they try and do things like enter someone's home. It's a policy, we've got to live with it. It's not the most popular thing we do, but from a public safety standpoint, it's almost imperative. So, you can help. Don't leave that to the guy. With that one bear being the exception, hang those bird feeders high. If you have bears in your community, take them down for a little while. Birds will be okay. Just take them down for a little while until the bears get out. And we're, we really push out a lot of information have bears present in the community, or in the case of bot lines, we also have been dealing with that. A lot of folks know via the news media, social media, and so forth. Compost piles, yeah, if you put smelly stuff in there, they're going to go for that. And barbecue. Oh, wow. And there have been instances where you probably find a YouTube video showing a bear walking right up to a grill that's got a steak grilling on it, and snatching it right away and running off. Again. Oh. Mm. Kind of fearless. Wow. Mm. This is a biggie, and this is something we work on a lot on the eastern slope of the Pachuca Mountains, is getting the garbage secured, take it out the day of pickup, secure it in some kind of enclosure if you got to keep it in your garage, but until the day of pickup is best because they will come for it. And we've also had some issues uh, with life, protection of livestock too. So if there are predators in your community, bear, mountain lion, you know, roof enclosure, take them to the barn, get a livestock dog, something. It doesn't happen very often, but we did have a bear attack a horse in Benson for sure. Oh, wow. Was the horse killed? No, the horse survived, but it was injured. So the bear was attacking it to eat it, or was it just in its way? We can assume it was trying to eat it. It was, it was a corral, of course. Yeah, and it got in a corral. Wow. Yeah. And when hiking in bear country, some of this stuff is just good advice if you're hiking in the back country at all. Let someone know where you're going and when you plan to return. Okay, that's extremely important, regardless of whether there are bears in the habitat you're in. Make your presence known. Make noise. I got, I won't bother you with this, this is a little whistle. 
You can get them from bear wise and noise like a loud whistle will detract a bear. When, if you are approached by a bear when you're out, and I don't have a slide on this, stand upright, wave your arms over your head, make noise. If you can throw things at it that you don't have to bend over to get, like my key ring, your backpack, throw it. You, you got to get this bear to think that you're more dangerous to it than it is to you. Face forward, but do not maintain direct eye contact. Just stay facing forward. And if you can't get the bear to break off its approach, back away slowly. <laughs> hike during daylight hours. You'd be amazed how many people hike at night. Really? Yeah. You'd be amazed. And stay on the track. And avoid taking pets because if you have your pet with you, your pet is going to be perceived as more vulnerable by that bear or mountain lion. The word on bear pepper spray, the stuff works, but may, I can make a suggestion. If you decide you want to carry pepper spray, test it once. Because the last thing you want to do when a bear is approaching you is to fumble with your pepper spray and spray yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened. You see, they come with a little the attachment for your belt, yeah, and you should spray it down like that so it wafts up. If you spray it at that level, it's probably going to pass right over the bear. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. That's a really good Just test it. You'll have enough for a bear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and watch for bear signs. Also, there's a, there's a uh, the San Pedro Repair and right. Conservation Area display has a good example. Bear scat, you might want to take a look at that too. Scratching at trees. What's a bear sign mean? Like bike scat and things like that, or footprints? Yeah, uh, that would be scat, tracks, uh, scratch marks on a tree, that sort of thing. <laughs> Keep a clean camp. It's not, it's not that hard, and, it, and it's, it's safer for you if you do. Uh, don't leave food out when not used, sure. The sleeping area is, is really kind of critical. There have been bear attacks because somebody brought a bag of potato chips into their tent at night and the bear wants to get into the tent. Um, also, if you're cooking outdoors, your clothes and your body is going to have the scent of the food that you cooked. So when you go to bed, you're still going to smell like whatever you had for dinner and the bear's going to smell. Use, use those bear lockers that are, uh, a lot of campgrounds have them, again, more like a foot locker on a pedestal with a locking mechanism. <laughs> and then as we were saying, I'll show you a diagram. I know the bear of the bird feeder doesn't always work, but uh, 10 feet off the ground if you can manage it, 4 feet from the post. Like that. Kind of corny for Bermuda Triangle, I'm sorry. <laughs> 100 yards seems like a long way, but you really that, that's the safest way to do it if you can manage it. Okay. That's something we don't practice very much. This is a bear trap. The back has a has a trap door. The front has a bucket suspended from the ceiling. We fill it with delicious bear stuff, like watermelon, like dog food dripped in honey. Like raw bacon, anything to get them to go into the back. And when they go to the bucket to get the food, the trap door swings shut behind them. And then we truck them off to a better place for them than in the neighborhood that they ran. And we ear tag. Here's an ear tag that we use so that we can keep the bear straight. Because if we've had to handle a bear, we want to be able to identify that bear down the road. So we've got some history on it. And the back of it, I'll, I can hand this out. It's kind of grungy because it was on a bear for a while. Do not consume, right? We don't want a sportsman who might take bear to eat meat from a drug bear and with a number to call. And they're color coded. Uh, we don't use this color anymore. We use purple so that we know the bear is from our region, Arizona Game and Fish, Tucson as all of southeastern Arizona. And then other regions have color codes too. So at a glance, we can tell we've got a bear that's been running around uh, the Safford area that walked all the way over from New Mexico. We know that we know that oh. by the ear tag. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you advise hunters if they see an ear tag, do not take that bear because it's been drugged. 
Yes. Well, no, that's not that's not true. We just we just have the tag on here so that they know if they do take the bear, they should not consume. We have a lot of bears running around here with ear tags. Um, Right. 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 Okay, I, I opened the presentation by talking about 2012. It was a really challenging year for Arizona Game and Fish statewide to manage the bear population. The worst thing that happened was an attack in Pine Top. A woman in a condominium complex in Pine Top came out of her home about 10 o'clock at night to walk her dog. And she walked by a dumpster and a big bear was in there dumpster diving. And the bear reacted instinctively and immediately attacked her. Her husband, hearing the commotion, came out, drove it off with a car, and then it came back and attacked her again. She lingered in the hospital for a month. She did not die of her wounds. She died of an infection that she got from the mouth. Oh. And then there were two other attacks, much less severe, you notice they're all in Payson, in that belt oh. from about Pine Top up to Flag, where we've got the greatest density of bears. And then we had the bears in Sierra Vista. <laughs> this is a photo taken by Sierra Vista TV, as noted, and they're hazing a bear back to what you was. Basically, they're chasing it with this car it headed back to the mountains. This happened repeatedly in the summer of 2012. Mm -hmm. What happened to you? I can't, I can't remember. Her. It's been a while. This is what happened. In 2011, the Monument Fire roared over the eastern slope of this mountain range, burned 30,000 acres, 47 square miles, and burned up this stuff, right? Acorns, junipers, or oak trees, junipers, and Manzanita. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, it's typically, and just so you know, and I, I grew up and I saw Dizzy and Bambi and all that stuff, and I remember Bambi's mom being overrun by the fire. Rarely happens, okay? Most wildlife gets out of the way. Either they move away from it, or in the case of burring animals, they, get, they go under it. What happens though, and what probably happened to that poor bear, is he was asphyxiated. Smoke inhalation and the oh. wind was overrun. Uh, in the Wallow Fire a few years ago, we had 40 elk entrapped in a box canyon. They got into a canyon, they couldn't climb out, oh. and they were all asphyxiated, lost 40. But it's rare. It I'm sorry, happen. I didn't hear what you said. That was 40 what? We lost 40 oh, elk, elk all my word. in the Wallow Fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was just a case of entrapment and, and asphyxiation, not actually being burned over. Now, it's a funny thing about the fire. The fire Memory serves was June, July. We didn't, and that was in 2011, we really didn't see the impacts of that fire on the bears until the following year. And then things got weird. Because they came out of the dens hungry. Is this a crazy looking bear or what? <laughs> he's got long hair in the back and he's blonde. He's got short hair in the front and he's brown. And this kicked off, this was our first of 100 bear sightings in 90 days oh, wow. in Sierra Vista. The bears were literally starving. So this guy had gotten into an apple tree down on Hereford Road. Some of these dogs chased him up there. We stood under that tree for eight hours waiting for that bear to come down. We drew a crowd of 100 people, including the news media. Everybody was rooting for the bear, naturally. When finally everybody left in the sunset, the bear came down. But he was a problem bear his entire life and ultimately was put down at Fort Huachuca, where we repeatedly got in trouble. Ah, Mr. Vega. I want to introduce yeah. Raul Vega, Regional Supervisor, Arizona Game of Fish Tucson. Good afternoon, everyone. And early in his career, a bear researcher. So if you have questions afterwards, you want to talk to a real expert, talk to my boss. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Things escalated. Remember, that bear that was up the tree up for Purgro, that was July. Miller Canyon gets a fair big number of bears, so it was just a good photo that I can put in here. But this bear was on Foothills Drive in US 92, not far from here in Selma's backyard. Okay. As is our practice, to the extent we can, unless it's an inherently dangerous situation, we move this bear to the Patagonian Mountains. Unfortunately, 
across the border from there. Oh. It was put down in Novellas by the police department. Oh who, the headline said it was a grizzly. Oh, it's a grizzly. <laughs> Our canyon, we had a bear trying to break into a house. Pounding on the door in the dead of night. We had to immediately remove that bear. Same scenario I described to you earlier. When they start to try and hide, enter dwellings, that's that's about the limit of our tolerance. And then there was the bear who was eating soldiers' picnic lunches on board which Oh, yeah, they have a policy there that, that soldiers retreated. It's not in their nature to retreat, but they did. The bear came in, he ate the picnic lunch. The bear kept hanging around. He was seen running around the golf course about five o'clock in the afternoon one day, scaring the heck out of golfers and charged one of our officers. Unfortunately, that bear, based on behavior, had to be put down there. So, the end of the story is we had to briefly remove four bears, but we moved four bears. Although 50% of the time when we relocate a bear, they try and get back to the place we re relocated them from. Walking up to 100 miles to do that. We had one that we put in the extreme corner of the state off Geronimo Trail near the border with New Mexico, and it came all the way back over here. But it's a good, it's a good practice, particularly with females and with cubs. We'll give them a couple of chances in some cases, depending on the circumstances. And we had to get some help. I mean, the city of Sierra Vista, we presented to twice the city council. We went and asked for their assistance and through their social media channels and other means, got the word out about being safe in bear country, which was largely about securing food and other attractants. And then last but not least, every once in a while I get approached by Boy Scouts. There's always an Eagle Scout out there who needs a project. So the young man on the right called me, I sorry, I can't remember his name. He said, I need an Eagle Scout project. I said, well, I got a project for you, buddy. We're going to Sierra Vista. And we spent the day in the neighborhoods on the Eastern Slope and Boy Scouts posted bear, these bear country signs. Uh, I think, let's see, 10 signs. And they went door to door, they canvassed the neighborhoods, 100 homes, they knocked on the doors, they handed out the brochure that you guys have in your hands, and they handed out a copy of the No Feeding Wildlife Ordinance in Fritchie Scouts. So we're indebted to the Scouts for doing that, because I couldn't have covered all that territory, but they did, and they did a good job, and he got a good Eagle Scout project out of it. We do, we do save quite a few. This is a price. This is every wildlife manager's dream line, right? It's got a photo of the bears. Unfortunately, mom had been removed, but we got these guys. They're alive. They were tranquilized so we could transport them. Uh, they're at a zoo in Texas now. And another case of bear rescue on Fort Huachuca in partnership with the fort. This was a really tricky situation because each, She's not depicted here. We had a mother with two cubs. They were out, I can't remember exactly where they were on the fort. Soldiers doing physical training ran by them. Mom went up one tree and the cubs went up another tree. Fortunately, we were able to reunite the family. It took some doing, uh, but we got them all back together. Sweet photo though, huh? And I love the little bear on the right in the bottom frame. He's kind of looking like I don't know what I did wrong. What <laughs> 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 I did wrong? Really? Yeah. <laughs> the officer in the photo, uh, Matt Braun, it was his, the, the summer of 2012 was his rookie year here. He's the guy who had to respond to most of those 100 bear calls in 90 days. It was a baptism by fire, but it's very awesome. <laughs> Birders tend to run up against bears more often than other segments. We had a real problem in 2016 with a bear in the Dara Canyon who discovered backpacks. This is an interesting story for you birders. A birder was up in the Dara Canyon, great place to go birding, sat down under a tree, took her backpack off, <laughs> looked up the tree, and there was a bear in the tree. Probably startled up the tree. Bear in mind, if you come across a bear up a tree, get your photo and then don't linger because that bear is going to stay up that tree as long as you're underneath it. Um, she backed out of the area. She had power bars in her backpack. 
Mm -hmm. Voila, Bear discovered backpacks mean food. He would not leave hikers in the Madera alone. Every back, every hiker in there, every birder in there, who had a backpack, he would approach and he just would go clear. I mean, imagine if you came down a trail and saw that, and he's not going away. That's the bear that was causing all the problems in the Madera. Question. If you spray them, if they got like maced every time they approached, would they not get like the negative reinforcement with, or would they well, still continue? We'd like to think that, right? Because well, if, if you deter asking, them yeah. and get to associate human beings with uncomfortable situations, right? I mean, they're not they're not ferocious like grizzly bears. They're shy yeah. creatures, basically, but they're curious. I've seen them, they've never come close when right. I'm hiking, so. Well, this one had, had backpack imprinted and it's had power bars, um, like power bars. So nobody ever maced them? I'm not, not to my um, knowledge. That stuff does work. And this was the area, and here was the thing. Um, the run up to the trails is right here. And there's a great network of trails in the Dara Canyon if you approach, excuse me, uh, from the west. So the Forest Service, in cooperation with us, Close most of those trails. The problem is the network of trails extends to the other side of the mountain. So even by closing the trails, we still couldn't protect the public. It was late in the year. We thought maybe we could wait this bear out and keep that down. So it's a real challenge. Um, and, and even the Forest Service wasn't immune. While the trails were closed, the Forest Service sent a, a bunch of hot shots up there to do a little trail maintenance. Darn if that bear didn't show up and got their backpacks. Oh, they had to run off. So it's because you work for them. I know in this area they have that summit challenge in the summer where they the goal is to do three summits. Uh -huh. Have they ever had problems with bears? Not that I've heard of. But you know, our problems with with bears outlines others tend to be most acute in the months of May and June. Because the monsoon hasn't come yet. That's when they tend to get in areas they shouldn't be or are strapped for resources. We have these human wildlife conflicts we've got to manage. I'm not sure if some challenge some too. Or you're under a tribe. And they can be quite destructive if they get into a car and they will get in a car even if they smell crumbs between the upholstery. Right, Whoa. they'll get in there and tear it up. This was the bear that kept the bunch of the birds in the bear. Year in, year out, we deal with a lot of bears, particularly in May and June, as we noted. The officer in the photo on the left is not looking at leaves. We were moving that bear. He's got a dart gun in his hand. He's going to try and tranquilize or dart it. I can't remember the outcome. The little bear there in Madera Canyon in 2020, another case of a bear invading a picnic. People are having a picnic, the bear comes rumbling in, everybody disperses. And then at the top, that's the kind of behavior that is most problematic. That was in Summer Haven in 2017. The bear was trying to uh, get into this cabin up in Summer Haven. It's all about behavior. Management decisions with bears are driven by behavior. They're just passing through, not causing a problem. That's one thing. We'd like to know about their presence so we can monitor their movement and behavior. But it's there are certain triggers. Last year was the year of bears climbing things. Now, unfortunately, we, they can get electrocuted up those yeah, balls. Yeah. These two did not, fortunately. If you look at the one in Denson, you can see a, a, a road right there with cars passing by. Who's at a car wash, Mr. Sudsy or something like that? He just had a climbing tree and check it out. And uh, the bear in the upper right, that's in uh, Pima Canyon, relatively low in the canyon. Which brings us to this year. And we got off to a fast start once the bears came out in late April. The bear on the right wandered around Midtown Tucson for a good wow. three days. Oh, Even wow. visited Fort Lowell Park. <laughs> and the thing, and it was a young bear, and this is something we see quite often after they've separated from their mothers, usually by age two, 
they do a walkabout. They really don't have an established territory yet, but trying to figure out how the world works. And we think that's what was going on with the bear on the right. Um, and it was funny because we, pardon me. That's what the Craycroft is, were you saying? Yes, that was the bear on Craycroft. And it was it was a challenge because we get a we get a call about the bear and we go out there because our intent was to tranquilize it and move it back to the Santa Catalina Mountains. It was you know it was just moving around. It really wasn't threatening anybody. And every time we go to that location, it was gone. So we kind of leapfrogged around the near north side of Tucson, trying to catch up with this bear. It's our understanding we did not witness this. That uh, he was on Craycroft Road, which is a fairly busy thoroughfare, headed north toward the mountains. And he got hit by a UPS truck, oh. went flying in the air, and it, it didn't break a stride, just kept on going north. Wow. Oh, wow. What happened to the truck? <laughs> <laughs> but again, this is not something we witnessed, but we got a witness wow. report that the bear flew in the air. So pre that's pretty tough. Wow. Wow. Pretty tough critter. Did the UPS guy have to go home and get a clean? <laughs> we didn't hear about any blood. It's just, it's just, you know, maybe it was just a kind of a glancing blow, but it got him airborne. And he kept moving, so all well that ends well. And this bear, we're really, this one at Mount Gray, we're really kind of proud of because we preemptively moved him. He was, Riggs Lake is a popular fishing spot up on Mount Gray, now, but sometimes we have fish die ups up there, and the fish roll up, and then the bears start browsing the shoreline. And this guy was doing that kind of activity, and of course, he was coming into contact with fishermen, but he hadn't done anything dangerous yet. So we thought, let's get him out of there now before his behavior escalates, because it probably would. And so we trapped him, and now we moved him to a, a remote location. Which brings me to bear-wise. We have great resource materials. You have our Living with Black Bears brochure. You can go to acgfd.com to look up more information about bears. But if you really don't want to do a deep dive, go to bearwise.org. It's a national organization, mainly states in the, uh, in the south and the east have them. We're new to the program this year and are trying to encourage people to use those resources available through the Bearwise program. And if, you, if you're into documentaries, check out the Bears of Durango. There is an excellent documentary that was making the rounds of the film festivals in the West last summer, and it pretty much details uh, a study done by Colorado Division of Wildlife to understand bears in the in an urban setting, and specifically in Durango. It involved uh, going into dens and uh, pulling out sleeping cubs to weigh them measure them, Ooh. which my boss has done, <laughs> and uh, but it's it's enthralling, and and it's even though it's about the Colorado Division of Wildlife, it's the kind of work we do too. It's just very very comprehensive. I think that's it, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'd be happy to take any questions. Why are they so cute? Why are they so cute? Because <laughs> you're a young human being. We tend to be cuter when we're younger. Maybe anything is cute. You know why? Because they have those big ears. That's part of why it looks good. Yeah, but remember, they don't have those big ears forever. When they get older, they get really little. That's kind of a thing to know. Compared to how old the bear is by their ears. Well, to me, they're smaller and older. They're very average. We were to a bear in the back. But the ears don't change, huh? I'll give you a little bit. Simply say it's just a little bit. We ran into a bear in Blacktail Canyon a few years back. Okay. And this guy had an air horn. Good. That's a good one. <laughs> Did it work? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that works. Three times for me. <laughs> Compared to this whistle I got on my hip, that air horn is like the best yeah, thing you can do. Uh, air horn and sound? bear spray. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is everything like a bear that broke into a house and then just people think that well, I, I can't remember a bear that took up residence like a squatter, but they've torn, they're really good at opening doors. 
uh, in the Derrick Canyon, which is in the Santa Rita's. One bear left the burners on the stove. Why he was trying to get burners on we don't know. Well, I'll open the door. This have a lot of beginning of the year. Let's see, and it was... Uh, yeah. So no, we haven't actually come upon a bear in a house, but they do get into places regularly. They tear them up. Cool. They go from refrigerators to refrigerators. And then it sees the food. Right? And then you see them. Sorry that happened, but remember my cartoon from the Why are the bears here, right? Well, we built a castle. We got the right number. Folks, we're, we're in a Q&A session, and we have people on the phone back there causing difficulty in hearing, and we have a lot of different conversations. We appreciate Mark staying to answer your questions, so I'd ask you to remain silent unless you're talking for a question. Please do that for everyone else, because I, I couldn't hear you talking because of all the noise. Thank you for the interruption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you've been a great audience. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming out. Hope you learned something. <laughs>